Hi, my name is Dr. Robert Tobolowski. Uh, I'm going to be your instructor for this course, which is Chemistry 212, Organic Chemistry 2. Uh, this lecture is part one of two of the review lectures. So before we start this class, I want to review what I find are the most important topics from Organic Chemistry 1. I'm a big fan of pencil on paper practice. So if you have some paper handy or your iPad, you can take notes along with me. I think it's really gonna help you remember and retain all of the things that we're gonna go over. Now, if you're watching this and it seems super easy, you may wanna skip taking notes and you can just watch it on double speed. But again, I really, really, really encourage you to take notes along with me. There's gonna be times in the video where I ask you to pause and think about something. And uh, I really encourage you to play along with that because. Uh, Again, if you just watch this as a video, like something you would see on Netflix or TV, it's not gonna be as effective as you treat this as an actual lecture, okay? So make sure you're in a place that's free of distractions. You know, you don't wanna be eating or sleeping or <laughs> in the shower. You wanna be focused on this and sitting down in a quiet, dedicated space for study. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with review, which is some of the most important topics that I think from Organic Chemistry 1. And we're gonna start that conversation right now. So the most, one of the most important topics from organic chemistry, one that I want to review is hybridization. So we know that carbon can hybridize. By the way, I'm going to make the PDF of these notes available to you for review afterwards. So don't worry about, you know, if you miss something, you'll, you'll get to see the full PDF after. Now hybridization um, is the idea that atoms that have both S and P orbitals can undergo this theoretical process of hybridization to change their shape. And the way that we're going to calculate hybridization in this class, just like we calculated it in the class before, is a highly simplified method that involves calculating the steric number. So what is the steric number? So steric number is either going to be 2, 3, or 4 for this class. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you how to find the steric number in just a moment. But before I do that, let me just kind of create this little table. So the first thing that the steric number tells you is the electronic geometry, which is another way of asking the shape. Okay, now electronic geometry, if the steric number is two, uh, we're gonna call that linear. If the steric number is three, we call that trigonal planar. And if the steric number is four, that is our good friend tetrahedral. The uh, shape, also known as the electronic geometry, gives us information about the bond angle so if we know the shape, we know the bond angle. For linear, uh, you probably know that's 180 degrees. Tet uh, trigonal planar is 120. And tetrahedral is a weird one, 109.5. Now, am I ever going to test you on these exact numbers? No, I'm not going to test you on these exact numbers. However, at the end of this class, you are going to take the ACS final exam, which is a cumulative final exam that covers not just organic chemistry too, but also topics from organic chemistry one to a lesser extent, but that's to be expected because the class is highly um, cumulative, just the nature of organic chemistry. And they may ask questions about these bond angles, so it would not hurt to commit these numbers to memory. And then finally, the most important part here is what is the hybrid? So for uh, steric number two, that's SP. For steric number three, that's SP2. And for steric number of four, that is sp3. Okay, so what is steric number? That's clearly the key to all of this. So steric number is actually calculated in a very simple way. It is equal to the number of sigma bonds. Another way of saying sigma bonds is the number of atoms attached. So I'll just write that, number of atoms attached plus the number of lone pairs. Now keep in mind, it's not the lone pairs total in the molecule. In order to calculate steric number, I have to 
indicate to you a specific atom. You don't calculate the steric number for a molecule. You only calculate the steric number for a particular atom. Let me give you an example. So a great example is methane, CH4, one of the simplest organic compounds you can have. Now, if I asked you what is the hybridization of this molecule, that's a nonsense question. I have to ask you what is the hybridization of a particular atom. So let me draw an arrow and a question mark. That way you know I'm asking you, what is the hybridization of that atom? Well, we just need to calculate the steric number. How many atoms are attached to that carbon? Four. And how many lone pairs are attached to that carbon? Zero. So the steric number equals four atoms attached plus zero lone pairs attached. The steric number is four, so therefore the hybridization of that carbon is gonna be sp3. Very good, okay, let's try another one here. Um, you know, I kinda just make up these examples as I go, I don't have it all planned out. But let's take a look at this example here. Okay, here's a kind of a funky one. What is the hybridization of this carbon? It's got a plus charge on it. Okay, so does charge come into the steric number formula at all? No, the charge is not in the formula to calculate steric number. We simply ask how many atoms are attached. So how many atoms are directly attached to that central carbon atom? Well, if you count, there's one, two, three atoms attached. Don't count the additional atoms that are attached beyond the direct attachments. And there's no lone pairs, so the steric number is therefore three atoms attached plus zero lone pairs equals three. So therefore, steric number three, this is sp2. So this is not a hard calculation at all. Let's do one a uh, little bit trickier here. Let's try, okay, here's a good one. This is a formaldehyde. It's a highly toxic and carcinogenic compound. If I identify this carbon as the atom I'm asking the question about, let's calculate the steric number. Okay, here's the tricky part. How many atoms are attached? If you're not careful, you might say there's four atoms attached, but no, there's not four atoms attached now, are there? There's actually only three atoms attached. There's an oxygen, a hydrogen, and a hydrogen only three atoms attached. Do not count the oxygen twice. In other words, double bonds and triple bonds only count for one in the steric number formula because it's only one atom that's attached. So again, we use our steric number formula. Attached to that carbon, there are three atoms and there are zero lone pairs on that carbon. There are lone pairs in the oxygen, but that's not what we're calculating. Plus zero lone pairs equals Three, so the carbon in formaldehyde is sp2. And keep in mind that not just carbon can hybridize, any atom or any element that has s and p orbitals can hybridize. So for example, we could take a look at the oxygen up here. And if you do the steric number formula here, you can see that the oxygen has one atom attached, being the carbon. Remember, we don't count the double bond twice and the lone pairs on oxygen are going to count as two so steric number equals for the oxygen two atoms i'm sorry one atom attached the carbon plus two lone pairs equals three so the oxygen is also sp2 hybridized perfect uh so Anything else I wanted to say about hybridization? Oh yeah, this is kind of an important thing. Um, so hydrogen cannot hybridize. Why not? Because no p orbitals. That's a pretty important thing. So if I ask you, what's the hybridization of hydrogen? It's a nonsense question. It doesn't make any sense because hydrogen doesn't hybridize. It's just got s orbitals. So there is no hybridization for hydrogen. That's a trick question. And um, anything else I should mention? 
Oh, the bond angle. When we talk about the bond angle, what bond angle is that referring to? It's referring to the what is called the dihedral bond angle. So if I if let me zoom in on formaldehyde really closely here. So what is the 120 degrees it's referring to? It's referring to this angle right here as being 120 degrees. So why is that angle 120 degrees? Because the carbon in the middle is sp sp2 hybridized. And remember the bond angle for sp2 is 120 degrees. Similarly, if you go up here, this carbon we said was sp3, so even though it looks like it's a 90 degree excuse me, even though it looks like it's a 90 degree angle, it's not a 90 degree angle because it's three dimensional, you can't really see it clearly on the page here, but this is actually 109.5 degrees since it is sp3 hybridized. Okay, great. Now there's gonna be some practice problems that I post just to make sure you understand the concepts of hybridization. This is pretty easy. You know, you're either gonna have a steric number of two, three, or four. If you're getting a steric number of like five or six, you're doing something wrong. Those sort of steric numbers are possible, but not in organic chemistry, generally speaking. So you, you see that sort of higher level steric number with a transition metals. So that's more like inorganic chemistry, things like cobalt and titanium and things like that. You can have steric numbers of six or even seven or even i saw one molecule that was steric number 10 with cobalt that's some crazy stuff uranium does some crazy stuff too so but for the purposes of this class just two three and four okay next important thing i wanted to kind of refresh your memory about from organic chemistry one has to do with formal charge so we know in organic chemistry one we were working a lot with bond line structures so we would see things you know that look like this um, you might have a negative charge indicated with a lone pair and a negative charge on carbon. We call that a carbanion or a positive charge on carbon indicated with a carbocation, a plus symbol. Uh, so what I wanted to mention about formal charges, I want you to recall that if, I, if you look at a bond line structure, you should be able to draw its corresponding Lewis structure. And if you recall, carbon likes to make four bonds. So that could give you some information about the number of implicit hydrogens. Those are hydrogens that are not drawn on the bond line structure. Carbocations and carbanions, they like to make three bonds. So that also gives you information about the number of missing hydrogens. So we can redraw this as the Lewis structure. And if we draw this as the Lewis structure, we need to actually draw out all the carbons and label them with C's, which is very tedious, which is why we prefer the bond line structures, which we don't have to draw all the labels out. And since this carbon here that's sticking out of the ring has a plus charge, we know that it must have two implicit hydrogens because carbons with plus charges form three bonds. Similarly, this carbon right here, which is not charged, is gonna be making four bonds. So I will draw two hydrogens there so that that carbon has four bonds. This carbon only has one bond in a lone pair. I mean, it, it has, it, it's making three total bonds, but one bond to an implicit hydrogen. So there's only one hydrogen on that carbon because it's charged. And all the other carbons are neutral without charge. So they all make four bonds, so they need to make four bonds, so we need to add in the appropriate number of hydrogens, in this case, two hydrogens to each, to add up to four bonds total. If I'm looking at this carbon, it's making one, two, three, four bonds total. So you should be, I'm not gonna be asking you to draw Lewis structures in this class. I don't think I'm anticipate asking you to do that. We're gonna be drawing almost exclusively bond line structures. So it's really important that you know exactly what bond line structures represent. How many hydrogens, like if I circled this carbon, you should know that, okay, there are two hydrogens on that carbon. And hopefully you're at a level of practice coming into this class where that is not a challenge for you. But if it is, just let me know. I can give you some practice problems and make sure we smooth out any um, misunderstandings there. Again, and that goes for any time in this class, especially since this is an online class. Uh, it's gonna be really important that you reach out to me and let me know if you're stuck or confused or feeling overwhelmed early because as the class goes on and it gets you get further and further behind hopefully not but if you do 
uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for me to catch you up, per se. Because there is no magic bullet for success in organic chemistry. It's just a lot of hard work and keeping up with the material. And, you know, the material can start to feel easy and you can kind of zone out a little bit. But until you actually try the problems that I give you, and I'm going to be giving you lots of practice problems throughout the semester, you're never really going to know how well you know something. So please promise me, take a pledge right now while you still have a chance that you're going to do lots of practice problems. All the problems that I give you, do them, try them, and then come see me right away if you're confused about something. You can just send me a message on Discord or on the chat or an email, whatever. You just talk to me in lab or workshop and I will help you. Next topic I want to talk about, and uh, there's only three more things I want to talk about for this review session. I don't want to overwhelm you right at the beginning, uh, but it's functional groups. Functional groups are patterns or motifs that you will see in organic compounds. They have a predictable set of behaviors. Uh, you know, we've learned reactions where you can turn an alcohol into a ketone, for example, using PCC as the oxidant. Well, functional groups allow you to talk about these molecules in a way that we can communicate with each other in an effective way. So you need to know and memorize the names of all the different functional groups. If you don't know the names of the functional groups, you're already going to be behind before the class even starts. So some examples of the functional groups that I will be teaching you about in this class, we will learn reactions about these in this class, include the alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, which is the triple bonds, specifically carbon-carbon triple bonds, I should say. Everyone's favorite, I know I don't even have to tell you what this is, alcohol. That would be propanol. There's not going to be much naming in this class, so don't worry too much about IUPAC naming. We're mostly going to be looking at lots of different types of reactions. This is ether. This one here, a lot of students forget what this is called when you have a halogen attached. Sometimes they just call it, oh, that's a halogen. No, 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 that's not a halogen. That's a halogen attached to carbon that has its own name. That's called an alkyl halide. That's a beautiful functional group. The epoxide, that's the three-membered ether with oxygen inside. So that's epoxide. Um, amine is whenever you have nitrogen attached to carbon. We call that an amine. And you guys are going to love this. I actually have a whole chapter for you all about the reactions of amines, how to make amines, what reactions can amines do as starting materials. You probably remember back in Organic Chemistry 1, we had a chapter all about alcohols. Well, I know you've been waiting with great anticipation for what about amines? Ketones is another functional group we're going to look at in detail in this class. That's the CO double bond to carbon with carbon flanking on the left and right. We're going to take a deep dive into the aldehyde which is like a ketone, but with a hydrogen on one side. Carboxylic acid. I've got a handout with all of these on a piece of paper, by the way, so that's um, uploaded as a PDF for you. Amid. That's like the carboxylic acid, but it's got a nitrogen attached there instead of oxygen. And uh, last one will be an ester. We're going to talk a lot about these, a lot in Chemistry 212. We're going to talk all about these carbonyl compounds. There's like a whole series of reactions that involve these guys. So we're going to talk about that in detail a little bit later on. But this is just, the, these are the most important functional groups. You should definitely know these. Okay, next topic, second to last topic I'm going to talk about today. This is, this is going by fast. This is going to be easy. You know, the nice thing about when I teach these online lessons is I don't interrupt to stop and ask questions and things like that. So what that means is every lesson is really like just the pure knowledge, it's the pure concepts, and they're kind of short. I, I, I don't think this lesson is going to go over 30 minutes. So that's a nice, unless I, unless I don't stop talking right now. So the next topic is going to be resonance. 
Resonance will always be like one of the most difficult concepts in organic chemistry. It will also unfortunately be one of the most important. So this is just a straight review from Organic Chemistry 1. There are three rules of resonance. Rule number one for resonance structures, you can only move, sorry, hold on. You can only move pi or p electrons in resonance structures. So what does that mean? It means you can only move double bonds, triple bonds, and lone pairs. So double bonds, triple bonds, and lone pairs. That's all that can move in a resonance structure. You cannot move single bonds. You cannot make or break new single bonds. And atoms cannot physically move from one place to another either. So just double bonds, triple bonds, and lone pairs moving. Rule number two, don't violate the octet rule. Okay, that means you do not want to give any atom more than eight electrons, and you don't want to give any atom less than eight electrons. Everything should stay at eight electrons in resonance structures. Uh, there's just one exception to that, which is that carbon and boron may have less than eight electrons. So still not more than eight electrons, but they can have less than eight electrons, and that's for carbon and boron only. I'm not saying that those resonance structures are gonna be necessarily good resonance structures, but it, they don't violate any rules and that they are said to be um, reasonable is the word that I've heard used, is that they are not good, but reasonable. Um, okay, so there's a few resonance scenarios. Now, these are not rules, but these are scenarios where resonance structures are known to occur. And so scenario one is the polar pi bond. A very, very, very popular resonance structure is the polar pi bond. That's why I name it scenario one. And that's gonna be like this. If you have a pi bond, that's a double or triple bond that is polar, meaning it's two different atoms that are attached, for example, carbon oxygen or carbon nitrogen bond. You can move electrons from the double bond onto the more electronegative atom to create a resonance structure that looks kind of like this. Well, not kind of like that, exactly like that. That's the polar pi bond resonance structure. Now, notice that this second structure here is got a uh, six electrons on carbon downstairs. So that is kind of invoking rule number three that even though we're technically not supposed to have less than eight electrons on any atom, carbon or boron can violate that rule. And we see here that carbon here has less than six electrons. So I'm not saying that this is a good resonance structure, but it is a reasonable one. Remember that resonance structures are not like oscillating between the different structures. It's not like it's going from one structure to the other and then back again, kind of like a dog wagging its tail. It's nothing like that. Instead, both resonance structures are existing at the same time, superimposed on one another. So it's like the molecules in both states simultaneously, rather than flipping between the two. Scenario two is another resonance scenario. That is the lone pair next to pi bond. This one may actually be even more important than scenario one. I may switch this to scenario one at some point because I see scenario two so often. Uh, so an example of scenario two would be if you had, say, a nitrogen with a lone pair on it. There's an amide, the nitrogen's got a lone pair on it, and that lone pair is not part of a double bond, but it's next to a double bond. It can do a resonance structure where the double bond gets pushed away, in a sense, by that, that approaching lone pair. So the lone pair goes towards the double bond, and then the double bond turns into a single bond with a lone pair dumped on the far atom. So if we draw that resonance structure, again, this is a very, very common resonance structure.
we'll see it looks like that. Notice the resonance structures, um, they have a conservation of charge. So the starting structure is neutral, there's no charge. And the final structure is still neutral, there's no charge. Now you may be saying, well, what do you mean? There is charge, there's a negative charge right there and a positive charge right there, but they cancel out so that the net charge is neutral still. So whenever you draw a resonance structure, the net charge has to stay the same. If you start out positively charged, every resonance structure is gonna be positively charged. If you start out neutral, every resonance structure is gonna be net neutral. If there's multiple charges, they will cancel out. Scenario three, do I have room to fit scenario three down here? I think I do. I love these resonance scenarios, they're so nice. Empty P orbital next to pi bond. You know, a lot of students, they ask me, um, you know, what is an empty P? How do you find an empty P? Well, let me just simplify it for you. An empty P orbital is a carbocation. That's the only real way you're going to see empty P in this class is going to be a carbocation. So let me show you an example of scenario three. You could have a double bond, pi bond, next to a carbocation. That double bond shifts over into the empty P orbital and the empty P orbital ends up on the other side. Again, conservation of charge. Uh, a lot of students ask me, do you have to put the plus charges in a circle? No, you don't. Uh, I've seen it both ways, so I'll leave it both ways. There, it's, right, it's not right or wrong if you leave off the plus charge. Okay, and then we got scenario four. Scenario four is empty P next to lone pair. I ran out of room. Let me scoot this over just a touch. Perfect. Uh, let me show you another way that you can see an empty P. This is extremely rare. I don't think you'll ever see this in this class again. But you could have, for example, boron which typically has only six electrons on it. And so the example I use here is boric acid. So there's boric acid. If you look at the boron there, it's only got six electrons on it. So you can kind of think of it as having an empty P orbital there. Let me actually put that in purple. You can see a little bit better. So that's an empty P orbital right there on boron. The lone pairs on these oxygens, I mean, you could do this with any of the lone pairs on any of the oxygens that are next to it, but I'll just show it on the right oxygen here. That lone pair can go into the empty P orbital. Now, the arrow's a little bit funny. Notice that the lone pair is not actually going into the lone pair. We don't actually, I'm sorry, the lone pair is not actually going into the empty P. We don't draw the arrow to the empty P. We typically don't draw the empty P. We just kind of, a, we know that it's there. Instead, we just show it going to the single bond the net result is that it's going into the empty P orbital because it's creating a double bond. Sorry, my charge is a little messy here. There's a plus charge on oxygen now, a negative charge on boron now. You should remember how to calculate formal charge. If you don't, come see me. Um, because, you know, if you get the formal charge wrong on an exam, I'm just going to take off a point every time you get it wrong. And those little points add up, so don't do that. Okay, that's MTP next to lone pair. And the final scenario, again, this is all review, so I'm not really going to spend too much time on this. Scenario five is pi next to pi. Now, if you took this class with another instructor other than me when you were taking organic chemistry one, uh, a question I sometimes get from students is, do I need to know scenario one, scenario two? Do, do I have to memorize which scenario is which? And the answer is no. As long as you can draw resonance structures, I don't give a crap how you draw them or whether you label them scenarios or whatever. Just draw, be able to draw the resonance structures. I teach it this way because I kind of like to have it all at a glance, like what are the possibilities at a glance, but you may have learned it a different way and that is totally fine. Uh, scenario five, pi next to pi, it looks like this. You have a pi bond. You have another pi bond and they're separated by a single, single bond. And the resonance structure for this one just looks like this, where one pi bond kind of pushes towards the other. And so you end up a negative charge where the final pi bond is pushed and a positive charge where the first pi bond sort of left a deficiency where it left. 
and that would be the pi next to pi scenario five, which is a very rare recipe. You very rarely see scenario five, but I do want to mention all the possibilities. All right, that's resonance. Uh, there will be some questions to help you practice resonance, and there will also be a quiz to help you with resonance, so don't worry about that. I'll make sure you are still traumatized by the concepts of resonance. Uh, I know you would expect nothing less of me. Last thing I want to talk about today is conjugation. There's going to be a second review lecture where I refresh your memory on the table method, which is something we use to predict SN1, SN2, E2, and E1 reactions. Uh, but before we do that, I want to finish off this video with the last concept, which is conjugation. If you recall ethylene, Ethylene is the following structure. It's just carbon-carbon double bond with hydrogens. It's a gas. It's a very simple hydrocarbon gas. And uh, they actually use this compound ethylene to ripen tomatoes. So, you know, you may be wondering, you know, how do you get tomatoes in the winter? You know, tomatoes don't grow in the winter. Where are they coming from? Well, they're probably coming from somewhere like Brazil because in the wintertime in America, it's actually summertime in the Southern Hemisphere and Brazil has a lot of agricultural exports. So they will be growing tomatoes in Brazil, but then you have the problem. How do you ship tomatoes from Brazil on a boat all the way to America and then put them in a grocery store and then wait for people to buy them? Aren't they gonna be completely rotten? through that whole process? And the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, a tomato barely lasts a week in my fridge, you know, let alone a multi-week multi super journey from one continent to another over the ocean. Of course, they would all go rotten. So instead what they do, they actually pick the tomatoes while they're still green and unripened. And then when they get them to their destination, they spray them with ethylene gas, which is a chemical trigger that causes the tomatoes to ripen artificially, but it's the, the tomatoes themselves will release ethylene when they're ready to ripen. So even though it is an artificial ripening, it's the same compound that triggers the ripening both in the artificial and in the natural case. And it is so unusual to me that the tomatoes use ethylene as that kind of, a, it's actually a hormone technically that allows them to trigger that cellular process of ripening. Uh, to me, it, it almost makes sense. It's almost beautiful that Mother Nature would choose a gas for that purpose because, you know, the nice thing about a gaseous hormone is that it can then re readily diffuse to all the different fruits that are on the vine. So, you know, as one fruit starts to ripen, it emits ethylene to the other fruits and that, that gas can travel a good distance so that all the, the plants in the close proximity can get that chemical signal. Truly fascinating. Really smart of Mother Nature to come up with that. Um, but a bizarre choice to use ethylene of all choices. Um, now, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about conjugation. And if you recall ethylene's orbital structure, you would have a carbon-carbon single bond. And here's all the hydrogen. So I'm just drawing in all the single bonds, but that double bond is unique. It's a pi bond. And if you recall, a pi bond is when the bonding is not in the bond axis. The orbital overlap is out of, out of the bond axis and is occurring through p orbitals. Again, I'm gonna draw my p orbitals in purple. I don't know why I keep drawing them in orange. That are lined up with each other outside of the bond axis. What's the bond axis? This is the bond axis. So the bond axis is horizontal and the p orbitals are lining up vertically, perpendicular to the bond axis. And those orbitals have phase, so they have like a shaded side and an unshaded side. And what this does is it creates rigidity in the molecule of ethylene. The carbon-carbon bond, typically if it was just a single bond, could freely rotate. But since it's a pi bond, it has to line up and stay perfectly still with both carbons aligned with each other because the pi bond will break if either carbon is rotated even a little bit. So this is what we call the pi bond or pi interaction. And of course, in the middle here, we have a sigma bond, which is when the orbitals are actually facing directly at each other. That's a much stronger bond. The pi bond is actually very weak compared to the sigma bond. 
if you try to rotate one of the carbons, I'll show what would happen. Let's say we rotate the carbon on the right side. So instead of it being flat like this, we just rotate it like that. Now the p orbital It's kind of hard to draw it in 3D, but I'll do my best. So the, the p orbitals are always perpendicular to the bonds. So I guess this is a way I can kind of show like now that the now that I rotated one of the carbons 90 degrees, the p orbitals are also rotated 90 degrees. And so this is broken. I'll put a sad face. So anyway, why am I telling you all this? Well, the net the, the, the net result of all this is that when you have a double or triple bond, actually, um, the atoms that are participating in that bond become locked and they cannot rotate anymore because of the pi bond. So conjugation is a natural consequence of this. So I'll say conjugation naturally follows. And I mentioned conjugation because the, actually the first set of reactions that we're going to learn in chemistry 212 has a very strong connection with conjugation, which is why I bring it up now. You'll see next week when we start talking about the Diels-Alder reaction. Conjugation is when you have multiple pi bonds that are um, interrupted by single bonds, you get a long distance rigidity. The whole molecule becomes rigid over a long distance because you don't just have the individual pi bonds that are locked, but then the pi bonds become interlocked to each other. So I can show this by drawing, there's the single bonds. And let me just draw the p orbitals now. Boom, they all are now lined up with each other and engaging in some sort of pi bond interaction, right? We've got a pi bond here, but it looks like now we've also created a pi bond here and a pi bond here. So there's this long range pi bonding interaction that's occurring down the chain. And that creates that long distance rigidity, which is really important to remember. So what do you need to know? Well, you need to be able to recognize if a molecule is conjugated or not. Conjugation also occurs with things other than double bonds, as long as there's that long distance resonance or long distance rigidity. So another example would be this molecule here. Well, remember that a carbocation is an empty p orbital. So you have the p orbitals of the double bond, but you also have an empty p orbital of the carbocation. And so then that can receive some additional resonance from the nearby pi electrons and become part of that rigidity as well, become part of the conjugation as well. So this empty p, it was just still phase, it still should be shaded. So empty P can also get the love. And when I say love, I mean electrons from the nearby pi bond. Another example would be a carboxylic acid. Okay, if you draw the P orbitals of a carboxylic acid, There's p orbitals on both oxygens and the central carbon because they're all sp2 hybridized. So then you get this long distance rigidity or conjugation between those three atoms, the oxygen, the carbon, and the other oxygen. That makes the carboxylic acid, it's not flopping around all willy nilly. It's actually extremely rigid. And you know, that makes a big, the big deal in organic chemistry, whether a molecule's flopping around like, you know, a, a spaghetti noodle or whether, the, whether it's very rigid like a Lego block, right? Which is what we're going to be doing is building molecules and the rigidity matters. We're also going to be talking about biomolecules in this class, things like proteins. And you'll see the conjugation plays a role in the rigidity of proteins. And of course, that's important to your life. So this is literally a matter of life or death. So yeah, it's important. Anyway, okay, so those are the topics I wanted to review today. Uh, I have included some uh, links in this lesson if you need additional resources or refreshers on these topics and if you of course have any questions please let me know and i will see you soon in the next lesson